Okay, so today's lecture will be about Dirichlet series and modular forms, um, probably one of the most important the uh, themes of 20th century mathematics. So, let me just make general comments. A, um, a Dirichlet series, a general Dirichlet series is a, a series of the form. summation n going from 0 to infinity uh, maybe going from 1 to infinity it does not really matter and uh, e to the minus lambda n s does not really matter where it goes from but let us just take it like this where s is a complex number and the a n's uh, the lambda n's are real and the ANs are complex numbers. The, we insist lambda sub n uh, monotonically increase to monotonically increasing. Sequence uh, tending to infinity. So, we take such a series and we try to uh, study convergence of these series. Uh, if a sub n, if uh, sorry, if lambda sub n equals n, then essentially this series is a power series. The series is a power series. in e to the minus s I guess e to the minus s. And so, in some sense uh, a study of series of this shape includes the theory of power series, but it also includes uh, the theory of Dirichlet series because in Dirichlet series we usually take um, lambda n equal to log n. Then the series becomes becomes something like this n going from 1 to infinity a sub n over n to the s. These series were first studied by Dirichlet were first studied by Dirichlet And there are a convenient way of packaging lots of information uh, in 1839 and there were a convenient way of packaging information I am wondering if I can on these things. And, but, but Dirichlet studied them as functions of real variable and it is the credit of Riemann who insisted initiated a um, study of these series for complex values. In particular Riemann studied what is called a zeta function we already met it zeta of s summation n going from 1 to infinity 1 over n to the s. This converges absolutely for real part s bigger than 1 and the amazing thing is that this can be written as a product over primes p 1 minus 1 over p to the s inverse. So, this is all for real part s bigger than 1 this is p prime and as, as you all know this is this is really a statement about unique factorization it is telling, telling us that every natural number can be written as a product of prime powers and it can be written uniquely the one up, upstairs here in the numerator is a statement about unique factorization. So, this is an analytic reformulation of unique factorization.
of unique factorization theorem, UFT. And when we look at um, the contribution of Riemann in this context, Riemann's uh, remarkable paper, which is very short, begins by discussing analytic continuation of zeta as a functional equation and, and perhaps um, what is nascent in, in Riemann's work is perhaps a general theory of studying uh, functions which are multiplicative. Uh, Dirichlet series are often convenient to study multiplicative functions. So. Um, we already, Dirichlet already introduced for any character chi. Um, I'm going to use capital M because I've been, I think that's what I was doing in the previous lectures. So for any character chi, Dirichlet introduced these L series, LS chi, and because chi is a multiplicative function, we can write it as an Euler product in a similar way. Again, for real part s bigger than one, and Dirichlet. Um, notice that um, one needs to discuss some behavior of the function at s equals 1 in order to uh, deduce uh, infinitude of primes in arithmetic progressions. And I already spoke about that. But more generally, we have um, the following observation. Suppose f is a multiplicative function. i.e. f of mn is equal to f of m times f of n for all m and n relatively prime. Suppose we have such a, such a function and we can consider the Dirichlet series composed of this function f of n over n vs. And because of the multiplicativity, I can write this as a product over primes, 1 plus f of p over p to the s plus f of p squared over p to the 2s dot dot dot. So you can do that. And if the, um, if the function is completely multiplicative, if f of n is completely multiplicative. So this multiplicative function means this, f of mn equals f of m times f of n whenever m and n are relatively prime, but completely multiplicative means f of m, n is f of m, f of n without any restriction. So if f of n is completely multiplicative, then the Euler product, the product simplifies. See if it's completely multiplicative, f of p squared becomes f of p whole squared, and the next one f of p whole cubed, and so on and so forth, the geometric series, uh, then the product becomes product p, 1 minus f of p over p to the s inverse. Okay. Now, I believe Ramanujan was aware of this kind of um, fact. And in his paper, he, he does notice that um, the tau function being a multiplicative, well, he conjectured that it was a multiplicative function. So the tau function, so in his paper, um, in his 1916 paper, uh, Ramanujan conjectured 
that um, tau m n is tau m tau, tau m, and noticed and and uh, introduced. Let's put introduced the Dirichlet series. So let me let me point out. He conjectured this, and he conjectured that second recursion, right? Sec tau of p to the a plus one is equal to tau of p to the a, tau of p minus p to the eleven, tau of p to the a minus one. I mean, he conjectured this relation, these two relations, and said, well, um, if I have these, then the Dirichlet series tau n over n v s, because it's a multiplicative function, because it's a multiplicative function, I can write it as product over primes p, 1 plus tau of p over p to the s, tau of p squared over p to the 2s, dot, dot, dot. But now uh, the point is that if I look at the power series tau of p to the a x to the a a going from 0 to infinity if I look at this power series because of the recursion 2 this can be written as 1 over 1 minus tau of p x plus p to the 11 x squared. So re re recall here if I were to look at f of for a completely multiplicative function if I was to look at f of p to the a x to the a a going from uh, 0 to infinity this is a geometric series so this becomes f of p to the a x to the a a going from 0 to infinity. So then that becomes 1 over 1 minus f of p x. So what Ramanujan noticed was, OK, that's all the theory of these completely multiplicative things. But somehow the tau function is not a completely multiplicative function. Uh, but however, it, because of the second recursion, it should simplify. This power series should simplify in, in giving us something like this. And therefore, we should be able to write this as an Euler product p of 1 minus tau of p over p to the s plus 1 over p to the 2s minus 11 inverse. So in other words, um, the tau function is associated to a Dirichlet series with an Euler product which has a quadratic polynomial in its in its definition, hmm? whereas here it's a linear polynomial. So these Riemann zeta function, Dirichlet L functions are all one uh, one degree um, polynomials. Here it's a uh, quadratic polynomial, and so this is the tip of the iceberg of a general theory, obviously. Um, and perhaps um, you know Ramanujan had some intuition to that in that direction. About 50 years of work in this theme of modular forms and Dirichlet series. In order to study Dirichlet series, it is uh, convenient, it is uh, useful to have to have Abel's lemma which I will leave as an exercise for the tutorial this afternoon. Abel's lemma is a very useful technique, uh, not only for uh, studying Dirichlet series, but probably for studying generally many things in, in, in mathematics. So let, let m be an integer, a n, b n, complex numbers, a of r, summation a n m less than n less than or equal to r then 
m less than n less than or equal to r a sub n b sub n equals a of r b sub r minus a of m minus 1 b sub m minus summation m less than or equal to n less than r a of n b of n plus 1 minus b of n. So this can be thought of as some discrete analog of integration by parts. And having this in, in, in your uh, possession allows you to, um, this is point number one, point number two um, is the following. If you have any, any sequence of numbers, let capital A of T be equal to summation A n, n less than, less than or equal to T, then for any differentiable function F, We have summation n less than x, a n f of n equals a of x f of x minus the integral 1 to x a of t f prime of t dt. So using Abel's lemma, one can also derive this. Sometimes people use, say, this is also Abel's lemma, it's just the same. Yes. Huh? Pardon me? I, I can't hear you. Huh? Oh, M, yeah, we just, yeah, let M be an integer, let's fix it, yes. Is that the question? Oh, um, well, it's a sum um, up to, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Or, um, yeah, you're right. Uh, um, so what I want to say is, I, I just wanted to kind of allow myself. Um, yeah, let me let me put. Um, yeah, you could think of a of m minus one as, as zero for the time being. I mean, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, you could take it as zero, but it, it's just a, it's a formal calculation. Um, okay, so this is actually what I want to use, okay? <laughs> but I, I just wrote that down. Now, okay, so if you, if you have this, which is an interesting thing, it tells you that if you have some discrete quantity a n, uh, you can, you, uh, if you know something about the partial sums, you can um, say something about this general thing as, a, as an integral. So this, the function here is uh, you're differentiating it. So we usually, usually we apply this, we'll apply this, um, usually applied for, with, with um, f of n equal to n to the minus s. I mean, that's the function that we will apply it to because we, we'd like to look at a Dirichlet series, a n over n to the s, and then we'd get some information there. So let, let me kind of put this in front of you and say that um, try to apply it to do the following exercise. Exercise. Show that zeta s is equal to s over s minus 1 minus the integral 1 to infinity, the fractional part of t dt over t to the s plus 1, where, where the definition of the fractional part is t minus the integer part of t. So show that this is the case for real part s bigger than 0. So using uh, number 2, with um, f of n equal to n to the minus s, and knowing that the partial sums of 1, you know what they are, hmm, up to x, 
and doing the obvious, you can kind of deduce this. The advantage of this is that zeta s was originally defined as a Dirichlet series for real part s bigger than 1. And now I have an expression on the right hand side which makes sense for real part s bigger than 0. So this provides an analytic continuation of the zeta function for real part s bigger than 0. And you can see that it has a simple pole at s equals 1 and residue 1. And so if you were trying to ask about the Riemann hypothesis, the Riemann hypothesis is a statement that this vanishes only when real s is a half. This integral vanishes only in those cases. So that's all, that's, that's uh, one way of saying the, real, the Riemann hypothesis. All right, now there's an important um, theorem in um, analytic number theory called Landau's theorem. which I want to discuss. And before I do that, let me just say that um, the convergence of Dirichlet series is such that um, we can prove the following uh, lemma. If, uh, if um, for some S naught in the complex plane, the series summation a n e to the minus lambda n S converges for S equal to S naught then it converges, the series converges in, in any region of the form real part S minus S naught positive and the argument of S minus S naught is less than or equal to alpha with alpha less than pi over 2. In other words, here's, here's a picture. Um, let me make a picture here. So here's the complex plane. This is an important property of the uh, Dirichlet series. So here's S naught in the complex plane. And supposing I have this Dirichlet series converges for a specific number S naught. Then what I do is I look at the um, sheet or the half plate that I cut this way and any region, you know, as long as I'm, I'm not on that line actually, but I'm, I'm in this region, so for some delta positive, any delta positive actually, I look at this region. <laughs> that region, this thing converges. So that's a little lemma which I will not prove. If you have time you can do it, but uh, it's not terribly important, but I just wanted to mention this now. I mean it's important in analytic number theory, but it's not important for this uh, short course. So this is an interesting property and that allows us to make the following definition for Dirichlet series called the abscissa of convergence. So we define for any in the case of our Dirichlet series, the set of values, um, the set of values S for which the Dirichlet series converges contains a maximal open half plane. In this case, in this picture, in this picture the half plane is the whole thing to the right of this line. Half plane of convergence.
And if the half plane is given by is given by real part S bigger than sigma naught, we call sigma naught the abscissa of convergence. Of convergence. For that Dirichlet series. So, example, for example, zeta s given by summation 1 over nth s, this Dirichlet series has abscissa of convergence 1. Hmm? Okay, uh, so now I, w I think I'm ready to state Landau's lemma. So that means that's the largest region in which um, this thing is analytic. So here's the theorem of Landau. Let f of s be a Dirichlet series be a general Dirichlet series with non negative coefficients. then f of s has a singularity singularity and its abscissa of convergence so that's the theorem very um, important theorem, so I thought I'll prove it. So here's the proof. Um, let sigma naught be the abscissa of convergence. Without loss of generality, we may suppose sigma naught is zero. Because we can translate, because we can change a n a n by a n either minus lambda n sigma naught, and because a n's are non-negative, so are these, and we can continue our happy way. So. We can do that because we can replace change an by an a e to the minus n naught. Okay, so if of f, f of s is analytic, so we're going to assume. So what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that if the abscissa of convergence is now zero, I want to show that f of s cannot be analytic at that point. So suppose f of s is analytic. Suppose f of s is analytic. At s equals zero, then you know the nice thing about analyticity is that the function is analytic in a small neighborhood of that point. Hmm? Uh, 
See, analyticity is a very strong statement. So, thus, f of s is analytic in a small neighborhood of zero. So let's draw a picture. So here's zero. And so it's, it's um, analytic in a small neighborhood. I'm gonna make the neighborhood large because I know I'm gonna do something I wanna keep. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the small neighborhood, okay? Now, uh, the point is that, let's see if my artistic skills are good. So that's S equals one. Then what I want to do is I want to construct a circle of radius something or other so that, okay, that's a circle of radius something or other, okay? That's supposed to be a circle centered at one. So let me just move one maybe there so that it looks like a center of a circle. Hmm? So I, I construct a circle such that the little part that jets out uh, out of this line is contained in that epsilon neighborhood in which f is analytic. So thus we can find, we can find epsilon positive so that f of s is analytic uh, in s minus 1 less than or equal to So, yeah, is that okay with everybody? I'm just, okay, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I'll try to draw pictures properly, but uh, don't get too technical with, that, with the picture. Okay, so um, we know that the abscissa of convergence of the series is zero and therefore to the right of zero, it converges. So in particular, the Dirichlet series is analytic at s equals one. So I can write down, we know f of s is analytic at s equals one. So we can write down a Laurent expansion Uh, sorry, k equals zero to infinity. F k, the usual Laurent expansion over one k factorial, s minus one to the power k. Okay. Now, keeping in mind that f of n, f of f of s rather, f of s is equal to n going from one to infinity, a n e to the minus lambda n s. Right, that's our, so if I differ, now in the region of absolute convergence, I can differentiate as many times as I feel like. Hmm? In the region of absolute convergence, we can take k derivative of s, and you get minus one to the k, n going from one to infinity, a n lambda n to the power k, e to the minus lambda n s. So the value at one is just that. So I go back and put that in here. So let me get some more space. Well, I, I'll leave that picture, but okay, I'll need the picture, so I'll keep that there. Um, it's um, summation k going from one to infinity, zero to infinity, uh, minus one to the k over k factorial. Um, I'm going to change the uh, s minus 1 to the k to 1 minus s to the k. Here I'm going to put in n equals 1, 1 to infinity, a n lambda n to the power k, e to the minus lambda n. This is valid for 
um, s minus 1 less than 1 plus epsilon, less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon. I, I took a sufficiently small, you know, maybe the circle should have been slightly bigger so that I would be completely inside the, this, this little part that jets out. This little part that jets out is completely inside that thing. Yeah. I told you I'm not good at very, this art, artistic skills are not perfect. Okay, so you have this. And now the point is, if I plug in f equals minus, at s equals minus epsilon, put s, this converges, put s equals minus epsilon, and what do we get? Put s equals, um, yeah, put s equals minus epsilon, what do we get? We get f of minus epsilon is equal to k going from zero to infinity, um, epsilon, one plus epsilon to the power k, over k factorial, summation n going from 1 to infinity, a n, lambda n to the k, e to the minus lambda n. So everything converges absolutely, and so when I interchange summation, this is where the positivity is used, by the way. Everything is convergent. A n's are non-negative, so I'm, everything, when it converges, it's absolute convergence, so I, I can interchange summations uh, as, as, as I please. So what do we have here? We have summation k going from 0 to infinity, a n, oops, sorry, not a n, lambda n to the power k, e to the minus lambda n uh, over um, k factorial, 1 plus epsilon to the k. That's what we get. But you can evaluate this. This is an exponential function, right? So bring out the e to the minus lambda n outside. Inside, what do you have? E to the, e to the lambda n to the power 1 plus epsilon. So that means that this is really this is really equal to summation a n going from 1 to infinity, a n e to the minus lambda n epsilon. In other words, this series converges when I plug in s equals minus epsilon, but, that's, but I said the absence of convergence was zero. And so if it didn't have a singularity at that absence of convergence, I would be able to do this little trick here and show that the series actually converges and therefore the absence of convergence must have been to the left. This is a very interesting theorem. Uh, I would rate this as one of the top theorems in analytic number theory. And um, I think many people have been seduced by this particular theorem. Um, there have been at least a dozen attempts at proving the Riemann hypothesis trying to use this. Uh, they almost worked. <laughs> so it's an interesting uh, theorem in its own right. And here are some applications of it. So let me give you applications of this fact, some applications. Um, so applications and exercises. So one, uh, Zygmas of A of n is summation d divides n, d to the power a, right? That's the, we introduced that. So exercise number one is show that So here A and B, for any A and B are complex numbers. So if I take complex numbers and define this sigma sub A, this is what you get. So this is part number one. Part number two is specialize with T naught real. Put 
a equal to i times t naught and b equal to minus i t naught then sigma i t naught of n mod squared over n to the s equals zeta of s squared zeta of s minus i t naught zeta of s plus i t naught divided by zeta of 2s. Now in, in the book, so I just want to point out that in the book there's a typo on page 112. The, I think I wrote sigma of i t naught of n squared. There should be absolute value squared, not so sigma i t naught of n squared should be absolute value of sigma of i t naught. Okay. Now let me um, point, and so this is, this calculation is easy because um, these are multiplicative functions and I told you how to understand Dirichlet series with multiple local functions. You write this as an Euler product and you do the obvious thing and then you fiddle around with the Euler product factors and you, lo and behold, you get this nice little thing. If I specialize with A equals I T naught and B equals minus I T naught, I end up getting this. And as an immediate consequence of this, use Landau's theorem to show that the Riemann zeta function is never zero for all t naught real. It has no zeros on the line real s equals one. That's because if, if, it, if it did have a zero, suppose zeta of one plus i t naught was zero, then complex conjugation shows you zeta of one minus i t naught is also zero. So you end up getting a double zero at s equals one. We know it has a pole at s equals one that cancels that pole. So the double zero that's introduced here cancels the pole and this now thing is analytic. And what is the abscissa of convergence? Well, the abscissa of convergence is actually s equals one. So what happens is that uh, you'll, you'll um, Landau's theorem says um, uh, the, the um, it has to have a singularity at s equals one. So because it doesn't have a singularity at s equals one, it, you couldn't have had vanishing. So that's basically the proof. I'll let you tidy it up. Hmm? A similar result can be applied if you kind of introduce characters in here. A similar result can be applied for Dirichlet L series. And it's, I think it's an exercise in the book, but a similar argument shows L1 plus I T naught chi is not zero. So in other words, in one shot, you get the non-vanishing theorems for all these L functions. And as some of you know, or most of you know, um, the, these non-vanishing facts are equivalent to the prime number theorem and prime number theorem for arithmetic progressions. So you get them all in one go by just Landau's application of Landau's theorem. So you can see this is a very powerful theorem. It just kills everything at one go. And my suspicion is that in the, eventually when the Riemann hypothesis is proved, most likely this theorem is going to play a role. <laughs> so I thought that just in case somebody wants to think about it, this is not a bad thing to know. What I would like to discuss uh, now is a theme of going from modular forms to Dirichlet series and backwards. And from Dirichlet series back to modular forms. Somehow these two things are interconnected. <coughs> so suppose Here's a general fact that is essentially due to Hecke. 
suppose f of t is summation n going from 1 to infinity a n e to the minus 2 pi n t. Uh, okay, in my notes I got pi n t, let us put pi n t, let us stick to my notes. G of t is equal to n going from 1 to infinity uh, b n e to the minus pi n t. We will associate a Dirichlet series L f s uh, L g of s so. Suppose this is the case and that f of f of 1 over t is equal to w times t to the k g of t for some w which is a complex number and k is a real number. Then, so you see this is like a modular relation f, f of 1 minus f of minus 1 over z was equal to z to the k times f of z that kind of a relation. So, you have a modular relation then the, the theorem is then L f uh, oh I forgot to make some hypothesis with the a n's uh, we are going to assume that a n and the b n's are polynomial growth. So, for some c positive we assume that a n's and b n's are polynomial growth. Then L f s and L g s extend as entire functions and satisfy and, and we have the functional equation. pi to the minus s gamma of s L sub f s is equal to w times pi to the minus k minus s L sub g oops I forgot a gamma function gamma of k minus s times L sub g of k minus s. So, if I have a you, could, you don't even need to talk about modular forms. If I have two power series of this shape and if I have a functional equation of this kind immediately I get analytic continuation of these Dirichlet series and that they have a nice functional equation relating L f s into L g k minus s. This is, uh, this is a general theorem that uh, Hecke observed. Um, and I am not going to prove it because it is it, it, it's routine calculus, uh, we will skip it and if you have time you can do it in, in class uh, in the tutorial this afternoon. But I want to highlight uh, this, this uh, theorem because uh, of, a th of the general theme that, that uh, moves from the world of modular forms into the world of Dirichlet series and tries to move back. Well, this theme already appears in earlier uh, in the work of Riemann and Hurwitz. In fact, if you remember what Riemann was doing, Riemann noticed that if theta of t if um, 
if theta is that thing? Yeah. We might notice that if theta of t is equal to summation n in z either minus pi n squared t then theta of minus 1 over t sorry theta of 1 over t theta of 1 over t is equal to t to the half of theta of t the way I wrote it the way I wrote this thing and this particular thing can be used in this context because you see you can think of this as um, two times well better not make it two times there's n equals zero so that's one and then two times from n going from one to infinity a n e to the minus pi n t where a n equals one if n is a perfect square and zero otherwise right I could rewrite I could write this the series in this fashion and then it is perfectly poised to uh, you know in this fashion where f is equal to g now and k is a half and all of a sudden I get analytic continuation of what series? The series attached to summation a n over n to the s. Well, that's just zeta 2 s. So, um, Hecke's theorem includes the analytic continuation and functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. I mean, he, you just change variables, it's gamma zeta 2s, and um, you, you just uh, change variables and get back that thing. Now, the way Riemann approached, uh, this, is, this is obviously the key. So from here, from this functional equation, you're getting analytic continuation and functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. The question is, can I go backwards? Can I actually go from the functional equation of the Riemann zeta function and back, go back and get a functional equation for the, for the theta function? And the answer is yes. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, it's not 100% yes, but it's, it, it is yes in this case. Um, and, but let me point out that Riemann, um, to Riemann derived star, Riemann derived star or Jacobi derived star using an important um, theorem in mathematics called the Poisson summation formula. So let me say a few words about the Poisson summation formula which is also one of these one wonderful theorems in uh, mathematics and in, a, in many ways um, Tate's thesis can be thought of as a as a adelic reformulation of the Poisson summation formula and uh, once you have an adelic reformulation of the Poisson summation formula and apply it to some suitable test functions he was able to simplify Hecke's work on the analytic continuation on functional equation for the Dedekind zeta functions. Mm -hmm. So let me say a few words about the Poisson summation formula. There are lots of ways of stating this thing. I prefer the following because it's neat and clean. Uh, if you don't normalize your Fourier transforms properly, the, the, the thing becomes messy. Mm -hmm. So for the to discuss this, we discuss the short space. Schwartz space um, is consists of all functions, consists of smooth functions. Smooth means infinitely differentiable. Smooth functions um, f into c, 
complex valued functions from the real to the complex uh, such that such that x to the m f n x uh, soup of this x and r is finite for all um, m n non-negative for all m and n integers non-negative so this is uh, what's called a short space um, if you look at Tate's thesis again he's doing short space Adically and adelically and so on and so forth, right? It's the same. It's a nice convenient space to work in um, <clears throat> simply because you don't need to worry about convergence questions when you work in the space. Okay. Um, the other point is if I have a smooth function of, in the short space, I will define the Fourier transform. That's the definition of the Fourier transform. And it turns out that the map, um, you know, taking, you can take um, this map taking f into f hat is a nice map from the Schwartz space into the Schwartz space. Hmm? Fourier transform maps functions into the Schwartz space to the Schwartz space. And the Fourier inversion theorem is. Um, is the statement that if you take the Fourier transform of the Fourier transform, so let me do this, sorry, then that's equal to f of minus x. <clears throat> in, in, in other words, the Fourier transform is a transform of order four. If I do it two more times, you get back the function. Okay, so this is the Fourier inversion theorem. I mean, the insight of Tate's thesis is um, that somehow all this stuff that was being done classically for the reals and complexes should be done piadically, and then you should be able to paste it together. That pasting is called adelization. Hmm? And then when you do that and, and study Fourier du duality, you will understand that the function analytic continuation functional equations for these zeta functions are all coming from this fundamental idea. That's the, the brilliant insight. Hmm? So now, uh, in this context, though, let me just uh, state the post transformation formula theorem for f in S. We have so this is the way I remember. Poisson summation formula. This is what I meant by normalizing your Fourier transform correctly. If you do it with the either 2 pi and exponent, you'll get a neat and clean thing. If you don't do it like that, if you take the Fourier transform to be either minus ITX, like some Rudin does, you get a very messy and ugly Poisson summation formula. And you can see that in Rudin's book. It's very ugly. So this, this is the clean version. And the proof is. Uh, one line, um, the proof is one line sufficient, uh, provided you start sufficiently to the, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the proof is one line if you um, order it correctly. So let G of V be F of N plus V. And so this is, it's easily checked that because of all smoothness and the rapid decay that I've cooked into the, fun in the hypothesis, this is a nice function. It has period one. It has period one, as you can see. If I ch change v to v plus one, then that plus one there can be shifted to the n and change a variable, and you have that thing, right? 
So we can Fourier analyze it with the usual torus, R mod Z. So we can write the Fourier coefficient. So compute the Fourier coefficient. We can write a Fourier series. Fourier series of G. So what are the Fourier coefficients? Cn is equal to integral 0 to 1, g of v, e to the minus 2 pi i n v. And that's equal to integral 0 to 1. Well, you write down the definition of this guy, f of m plus v. Oh, I forgot a dB here. DB. So, as I said, everything is nice and, uh, nice and convergent. We're in the Schwartz space. Therefore, uh, you can recklessly cha interchange um, the um, uh, summation and integration. So, you do that. And in Z, um, and then change variables. Let me, let me do it all at one go. Oops, I changed, uh, yeah, it's okay, dx, dx, it's okay. Now here, by the way, keep in mind that when we change variables, um, 2 pi i n plus m, when you change the variable, it's neat and clean. So for the cognoscenti in the room, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, characters of the torus, and uh, the, there's an invariance under Z action. Hmm? So there's some fun, some group theoretic structure a, uh, actually going on in the um, in in here. So what is that? What is this now? Oops, what I lost a V somewhere, didn't I? No, oh, no, I didn't lose a V. Okay, that's fine. So this is what is this? This is equal to, well. This is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx, f of, e, uh, f of um, e minus 2 pi i and x dx. Which is equal to f hat by my definition. Okay. So in other words, let me just continue here because I promised you a one-line proof. Um, so this is equal to g of v is equal to, uh, so now I put in cn has been computed. It's equal to f hat of m e to the 2 pi i and v m z. So g of 0 equals summation m and z f hat of m. But g of 0 is summation f of m. That's the possible summation for me. Okay. So that gives you the result. And the nice thing about this is that you can apply the Poisson summation formula uh, to some spe uh, special test functions and deduce the analytic continuation of the the, um, the theta relation that I need for the Riemann zeta function that I just pointed out, and a host of other things. Uh, even for the Dirichlet L series, you can easily get um, the uh, required analytic continuation and functional equation from here. So this, again, I'm going to skip because you can do some Fourier transform exercises in, in, if you have time, that is. Yeah. But the key is this Poisson summation formula. And we... Um, Yeah, so using the Poisson summation formula, one can derive the analytic continuation and functional equation 
for the Riemann zeta function. We can do a similar, we can uh, derive similar results for Dirichlet L series. And this was done by Hurwitz about 20 years after Riemann did his work. But here, um, a small problem appears, like the old forms and the new forms problem. Of course, the old forms and the new forms problem appeared much later. This problem already appeared in the last century. And that has to do with uh, so-called primitive and imprimitive Dirichlet characters. So um, just to uh, keep in point, so if I have a divisor of n, um, I could, on one hand, I could look at um, a character chi. Oops, on the, from the co-prime residue classes, I have a character chi, hmm, like so. But if I have um, the oops, residue classes which are co-prime to n, I have a natural map. It's called it's a natural map. Any residue class modulo n which is co-prime to n is also co-prime to d because d is a divisor of n. Hmm? Therefore, I have this natural map. And so I can take the natural map projected to this thing and then push forward on this character and I would get um, chi star call it. Okay, this so I, I've, I've given you a character of z mod and z star obtained in this funny way. Okay, so these are called, if, if d is uh, strictly um, less than n, such characters are called imprimitive. If D is strictly less than M, such a character is called imprimitive. So you, you could have, in, a, in essence, this is not a character really coming from Z mod and Z star. It was coming from a lower level. Hmm? That's the idea. So these primitive characters and imprimitive characters are analogous to for old forms and new forms that I talked about yesterday. So if chi is a primitive character, so in order to study um, analytic continuation of functional equations, we must confine ourselves to primitive characters. So we say such character is imprimitive. Otherwise, we say the character is primitive. And then we say the conductor of the character, the conductor of character chi is n, in which case we say conductor of chi is n. So we have to make a differentiation between these two things because the conductor starts appearing in the functional equation. So here, here are the theorems. Theorems. If chi is an even primitive character, even means chi of minus one is one. Even, i.e., chi of minus one is one. If chi is an even primitive Dirichlet character. Mod modulo n, then Cs chi equal to pi to the minus s over 2, n to the s over 2, oops, gamma s over 2, ls chi, satis admits an analytic continuation. for all S and C and satisfies 
the functional equation C 1 minus S chi is equal to W C S chi bar where W can be given explicitly W is a complex number of absolute value 1 can be given explicitly in terms of Gauss sums. Okay, um, to make a long story short, if chi is an odd character, if chi is an odd character, the shape of the functional equation changes. The gamma s here is replaced by gamma s plus 1 over 2. Hmm? But you have a similar result. So let me just put dot, 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 and you can look in the book uh, what, what the situation is for odd characters. So there are these differentiations. One, odd characters and even characters and primitive characters. This We need to make these distinctions in order to uh, come up with a viable theory. Now, let me say a few words about general philosophy about L series attached to modular forms. If F is a cusp form on gamma naught of n with with character Neban type as chi and f of z as a Fourier expansion, <coughs> then as I mentioned yesterday, g equal to f slash the Atkin Lehner involution Wn, so Wn was equal to 0 minus 1 n0. This object again lives in SK gamma naught of n uh, chi. <clears throat> and it turns out that <clears throat> turns out that the L function attached And the um, the L functions attached to F and G, namely LFS, L sub GS, extend to entire functions. and satisfy the functional equation lambda f of s is equal to i to the k lambda g of s, oh sorry, k minus s, where lambda f of s is equal to root n over 2 pi the power s, gamma of s, l f s. And lambda g of s is the same thing with f replaced by g. <clears throat> so, did you have a question? Okay. So, so what we have here is if you have the modular relation, you're able to ex you get analytic continuation of functional equation. So the question, which is an interesting question uh, in mathematics in general is, is the converse true? Can I go backwards? 
Supposing I had analytic continuation and a functional equation, is there really a modular form in the background? That's the, that, was the, that, was the, that was the question that Hecke had. And he could actually answer it in the case of the full modular group. If the, if the, um, if the function really looked like level one. Notice, by the way, with all these objects, because the modular form lives on level n, the level seems to appear in the functional equation. So somehow, the functional equation encodes the level where it's coming from. Because I'm running out of time, and there's usually a class after this, uh, let me just say that um, using inverse Mellon transforms Hecke was able to prove the following theorem. Suppose Suppose L of S equals this, admits an analytic continuation, or let's say extends to an entire function. And Actually, I think he didn't have the W there. If I had that and satisfies his functional equation, then f of z equals summation n going from 1 to infinity, a n e to the 2 pi i and z is a modular form of weight k for the full modular group. That's because the functional equation with the inverse Mellon transform, so the idea of proof, idea of proof, is that the functional equation star, star via inverse Mellon transform, leads to f of minus 1 over z equals z to the k f of z. Leads to that thing. So what does that mean? It means that on one hand, f of z plus 1 is equal to f of z. On the other hand, f of minus 1 over z is, is this other thing, this, this other thing there. So in other words, f satisfies uh, because SL2Z is generated by is generated by 1, 1, 0, 1 and 0 minus 1, 1, 0. We get modularity of F for the full modular group because we have this. All right. Now, this is where Hecker got stuck and he was trying to say that supposing I had more complicated equation. So basically what he's doing is he managed to do n equals 1 of this thing. So if, if I start from here, can I go back and say it's actually coming from gamma naught of n chi? And that's where um, the contribution of V uh, comes in. The point is that uh, gamma naught of n 
is not just generated by one element, and besides the WN doesn't seem to be sitting there as an, as an element in, in that group. And so you have to do um, more. And so here is the, um, let me, let me uh, just uh, not even state the theorem, but just, um, just uh, describe it in, if star is replaced by a more complicated functional equation, what can we say? Well, forget the more complicated functional equation. Supposing 2 pi to the minus s is replaced by, for example, 2 pi to the minus s is replaced by, by you know, root n over 2 pi to the s. I mean, that's, which, which is basically, we'd like to say that that something comes from gamma naught of n. And um, this, is, this is essentially the Bayes' converse theorem. Uh, so what Wei says is that, well, we need more information. Um, so Wei's converse theorem basically says that if you, for each, if for every primitive Dirichlet character chi, mod q, we have analytic con appropriate, I'm not going to write it down because uh, appropriate analytic continuation <coughs> and functional equation <coughs> for the L series, for the Dirichlet series summation n going from 1 to infinity, a sub n, chi of n. So I twist, I twist my Dirichlet series by chi of n. So before I was just looking at summation a n over n to the s and having it extend to an annihilating function and satisfying function. I now need this guy for every Dirichlet character chi mod q. I need analytic continuation functional equation of the right shape. Then f belongs to the appropriate weight gamma naught n <coughs> psi for some for some psi uh, which is a Dirichlet character modulo capital N. So this is Vey's, this was Vey's converse theorem that was proved in the uh, I think 1970s, sometime in the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> and there were two reasons why uh, I guess Wave was interested in this, and that was um, this modularity, the Taniyama Shimura conjecture, where you had an L function of a elliptic curve. You'd like to say the L function comes from a modular form of A2. That was mod Shimura's, uh, Shimura Taniyama conjecture. So how are you going to identify something coming from a modular form? And um, so he introduced this in this fashion. Uh, later on, Razar, who was a student of Shimura, uh, in the 1970s, I think 76 or so thereabouts, showed that you don't need um, this hypothesis for every Dirichlet character Q. I think for every Dirichlet character chi mod Q with Q less than capital N will work. So from an infinite collection of checkings, he managed to reduce it to a finite number of checkings. And so that, that more or less um, gives a precise um, you know, version of Bayes' converse theorem. And now this, this particular theorem has taken off <coughs> in, the, in the Langlands program. And people in general ask, well, if I have some Dirichlet series, is this the L function that's attached to an automorphic representation a la Langlands? And that, that whole 
chapter in mathematics is called uh, converse theory. And it's a big active area of mathematics. So I think that more or less summarizes um, chapter 9 uh, <clears throat> for your um, uh, benefit. And um, hopefully uh, one more lecture and a few uh, exercises in the tutorial um, would help to um, consolidate your understanding uh, of this very important topic. So in the last lecture, I'll just kind of give you a potpourri of, of things and uh, tie up the loose ends. And um, that's about it, I guess. Well, I'll, yeah.